Hashem gives him more reward. Why? Because there's more efforts. If you pray at 5 a.m. or at 8 a.m., it's not the same. 5 a.m., you get more, more reward. Before we start the lecture, I just want to read those names. Bezrat Hashem. Okay, so, Latzlachat. Leilu Nishmat Shmuel Ben Adina. Leilu Nishmat Zev Ben Soraya. And Shulamit Batiafa. And Latzlachat David Williams. Leilu Nishmat Ilana Bat Najat. לעינוי נשמת שיילי יעל בת מורן. ברוך השם. וגם טוני בן עדינה. טוני בן עדינה. טוני בן עדינה. טוב. היום, ברוך השם, אנחנו חיים בגנרציה שזאת מאוד 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 Unfortunately, the Torah, everywhere you go today, there are a lot of modern speakers that went to university, and they mix between what they learn in yeshiva and what they learn in a university from the goyim. They make a salad out of everything. They make up their own psychology. They make up their own things, and they disqualify the entire shiur. I mean, you can see there for an hour, and instead of learning pure Torah, you learn a bunch of garbage. And I see it more and more coming now. We have to know that when you teach Torah, you don't mix your opinion. You don't mix your own opinion. What do you have to do? You have to teach exactly what's written. You got to choose reliable sources that no one question, like Rambam, Rabbeinu Yonah, Shulchan Aruch, Tanaim in Egmara, Chumash, Zohar, things that the whole Klal Israel accepted. And you teach from there and you stick to the source. Torah is not politics. In politics, everyone expresses his own opinions. You have an idea. He has an idea. can argue. You can make your own ideas. The more ideas you have, maybe one day will do something positive. But when it comes to Torah, you have to be very careful. Those who were not careful, for instance, look at the reform, reform people. I don't want to say reform Jews, like some people say, because it's, it's not a correct sentence. Why? Because almost all these people who call reform, almost all of them are goyim. They're not Jews anymore. Two, over 200 years, they assimilate with the goyim, they marry everyone. So they are bechezkat goyim. Even though some of them originally have a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, since we do not know, we have to assume that they're all goyim. Why? Because they already married with the goyim for eight, nine generations. They didn't care. So it all got mixed. There's no way to know. No way to know. We have to be extra strict. We can't take risks. We don't want our children to marry someone who tell you I'm a reformed Jew and in the end he's a goyim. It's not a Jew. Not that chas v'shalom, I have anything against the goyim. Some goyim are very righteous. But we have a restriction in the Torah. We're not allowed to marry anyone besides our own nation. That's what God decided. So it's nothing to do with racism and who's better and who's not. Nothing to do with that. Some goyim are much better than Jews and they're more righteous and they go to heaven and some Jews are not going to heaven. And some Jews are not good people. So there are good people on both sides, and there are righteous people on both sides, and there are wicked people on both sides. But it's nothing to do with good and bad. It's just that God told us in the Torah, you are my children, I chose you from all the nation, and I do not allow you to mix with any other nation. End of story. We don't even need explanation. It's a decree from the creator of the world. 
all goyim are allowed to marry each other. Everyone. Arab can marry American, American can marry Chinese, Japanese, Thailandi, Romanian, Russian. Everyone can marry everyone. It's no difference among the goyim. The Jewish people are not allowed to marry anyone but themselves. This is a fact. That's a, that's halakha. That's it. So when I say it's very hard to find authentic Torah, is because people made up their own nonsense and they get it into their lecture. Some speakers speak about Hollywood. Can you believe it? He gives a Torah shiur and he tells about some scenario from a movie. Some of them bring books of all kinds of secular authors. Some of them bring things from Islam, from, from Christianity, from the university, from all kinds of speculative science. They mix it all into the Torah. The Torah gets destroyed. That's not a sure Torah. You come there, it's become heresy. That's why you have to know before you begin to listen to a speaker, the last thing you care about is how they look. You don't go by the look. If they have a nice beard and a black hat, doesn't mean they're authentic. I know many kofrim that looks very, very much like Santa Claus. Nice beard, sombrero, everything. But reshaim gmurim. Mesalfim ta Torah, modify the Torah, rebelling against Hashem and destroying and murdering souls. One of them is actually popular. He's in my blacklist. He was invited here around here in Queens many times in the past. Baruch Hashem, the last time I was able to cancel it. We have an obligation to try to prevent wicked people and erratic people, heretics, from speaking. We have to fight infidels. And I'm allowed to let them open their mouth and destroy the Torah and brainwash the people with their nonsense. But unfortunately there are too many of them. So we don't have the ability to start fighting thousands of these infidels. That's why I'm teaching you today an important thing. The, the look, if he looks very religious, it doesn't mean he's kosher. If he looks secular, also. Now, you know, you don't want to waste your time. Look how he looks, look how he dresses. Barely as a yamaka. You can see right away that this person in Torah is not exactly friends. What can you learn from someone like this? He thinks he's some kind of a model, all day in a gym, gel in a hair. This is who you want your rabbi to be. So it works both ways. If he looks very kosher, it doesn't mean he's kosher. If he looks not kosher, there's no chance he's kosher. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's move on. One of the rules in Judaism that we have 13 principles. 13 principles of Judaism. If you are an architect, an architect, and you need to build a building, you need to put the building on 13 poles, foundation. What happens if you break one of them? You have only 12 instead of 13. There is a chance that eventually, maybe a month later, maybe a year later, maybe 10 years later, the building will collapse. You may say, ah, don't exaggerate. I only took one out of the 13. There's still 12 poles holding the building. That's not true. The architect has a reason why he designed 13 and not 12 to begin with. Once you take one out, it's like taking one tire out of your car. But you still have three. It's not going to help. You have a table with four legs. Only one you took out. There's no table anymore. The idea is, even when you write an internet address, divineinformation.com, if you don't put the dot, it won't open. It will be divineinformation.com. But it doesn't, it doesn't have the dot. Big deal, you took out the dot. What's the big deal? You, take, you took the dot, it won't open. Why? Because it's not original. In 13 principles of Judaism, we have a rule that God reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Pays everyone what they deserve. We also have another rule. They go together, not to get confused. The second rule comes to fix the mind of the people who has a question. What's the question? When you tell them God gives everyone what they deserve, immediately the Ignorant people get up and say, where exactly God 
he's paying the wicked what they deserve. The wicked people control the world. They murder people. They steal billions. They sell drugs to kids. They drive fancy homes. They have yachts. All the corrupted politicians, all those murderers, some of them have the life, supposedly. And look how many homeless people you have in San Francisco, in Manhattan, that went to Vietnam and gave their life for this country, and they sit on wheelchairs with no legs, homeless, and the rain right now is flushing their head, and nobody looks at them, and they beg for a quarter. So where is the justice of God? He that gave his life to protect the people of America was dumped to the garbage, and nobody looks at him. The politician who murdered hundreds of people for his corruption until now is having the life. So where is the divine justice? How many rabbis died from cancer they were not even old. How many Nazis lived to the 90s? So where is the justice? How many people give a lot of charity but are not rich? How many billionaires don't give a penny for charity? So why they deserve to have so, ma so many millions? Why? I can give you a million examples right now, just like that from the top of my head, why we cannot see any justice in the world. Yes! Sometimes we see righteous people that make millions. You may come and say, God loves them. That's why he gives them millions. It's incorrect. It's not true. Because the greatest people in history that God wrote in the Torah, that he loves them very much. Some of them were very poor. If you look at the life of the greatest hero in history, the greatest, Adam, creation of God, was not born to a woman. He lived a very long life. You know why? <clears throat> he did not have a mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was no one to bother him. So Adam, that was created by God, <laughs> was created by God, had a horrible life. It was supposed to be heaven. After what he did, he committed a sin. His life became hell. What comes after? One of his sons murdered the other. Imagine you have two boys and one would murder the other. Can you live after that? Your life is finished. It's, everybody talks about it. Look at this guy. His son killed the other son. And what happened? The other one also died. And all his children got wiped out in seven generations. Now one left from them. So there's no, nothing left from Hevel, nothing left from Cain. Every day Adam works very hard, knowing if I would not eat from the fruit, I wouldn't have to suffer so much. What a mistake I made. One minute mistake, for hundreds of years I suffer. Chava, Eve, also did the same mistake. Ate one bite. For that one bite, she suffered giving birth. All her children giving birth, women scream in the delivery room losing their mind. The Gemara said, when, uh, in the old days, a woman, after she gave birth, she had to bring a sacrifice. Why? Because all women make a neder, a vow that they will never dare to give birth again from the suffering they had to go through. So it's like a false neder. They have to go now and bring a sacrifice for it. Baruch Hashem, after a while, they forget the pain and they agree to become pregnant again. Today, Baruch Hashem, they have an epidural. Epidural. Is it good to take a pidural or no? What do you think? Good or bad? Yeah. There are two ways to look at it. Tell me which one you identified with. One is very bad. Why? Whatever pain you're supposed to get, God curse the women that when they give birth, they will suffer. It's a curse in the Torah. Betzar tel dibanim. You give birth to children with sorrow, with pain. Now the woman, she, go, she makes a, a trick. Doctor, give me a shot. I don't feel the pain. This pain that she was supposed to get, she got away with that? Or she's going to get it somewhere else? Maybe a month later she fall and break her arm or leg or accident. or It could be other things. It can be other things. The question is, can she avoid the pain? Or she only can avoid it right now, but it's going to come to her later. Or maybe no. 
maybe now she get the shot, and she got away with the pain. She's lucky science invented a good shot that take away the pain. Why not using it? The other way to look at it is when the world has a lot of problems, there is also a solution to some of those problems. So for instance, 50 years ago, many women were barren. They had this PCOS symptom and uh, their eggs are not opening up. And there's all kinds of things. Today, they have a lot of medication. Pills that they take helps it out. Or IVF. In the old days, there was no IVF. IVF give, give life to millions of babies throughout the world. It is, did not exist 50 or 40 years ago. The question is, why did God bring this idea that doctors can take a sperm, put it in an egg in a lab, and put it back into the woman, and now she has twins? It, it didn't exist for thousands of years. No one was able to do it because there was no microscope, there was no way to look. Now we have Baruch Hashem technology that can help a lot of women to, get, to, give, to give birth. The question is, is she allowed to use it or no? Because naturally, maybe God doesn't want her to have children. Obviously, she has a problem in her body that prevents her from getting pregnant. Who gave her permission to go around and to use science and stuff like that to, get, to give birth? Maybe it's not a good thing. Maybe God is very angry at her. Maybe he'll punish her by giving her terrible kids. There's two ways to look at it. She allowed to use it or not? Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, one of the greatest rabbi of our days, he was the biggest in Alacha in America. Rav Moshe Feinstein, one of the greatest rabbis, he answered this question when many people had that dilemma. He said that every medicine that Hashem allowed humanity to invent, every solution, every discovery that we discovered, it was always around, but we didn't know how to discover it. Like gasoline. Today we have it. When did they find out that gasoline can drive cars? One day someone invented this idea. Gasoline was always in nature. It always had oil. Or many other things that exist in the world. Diamonds, stuff, all of a sudden they decided to dig very deep in the ground and they found diamonds, right? Now they found a way to make diamonds in lab, even better ones, cleaner, nicer, much cheaper. Of course, people are full of ego and show up, show off, so they don't want lab grown uh, diamonds. Mm -hmm. Because then if people would think that they bought something instead of $20,000 only for $5,000, it's not enough ego, it's not enough show off. People would think we are cheap. We bought the, the girl uh, a cheap diamond. But it's really stupid. Who cares? You got a much nicer and a cleaner diamond. Why don't you want it? Because it's cheaper. That's it. Why? Because you cannot show off. Ah, it's only 5,000. Ah, that was 20. That was 30. Oh, wow, what a show off. Same thing with the clothes. You go and buy an Armani suit, $1,000. The same suit that is made in Mexico, without the tag Armani, is sold in Marshalls for $150. From the same factory. The same factory. What do you think? They only make for Armani? They make for a lot of uh, anonymous companies. And those companies don't have the name that he has. So you wear the same suit for much, much, much cheaper. But nobody cares, because when they look at the tag, they see some kind of a Mexican name. It's not it's an anonymous. It's not exactly an Italian name. You understand? So the idea, Rabotai, what I'm talking about is that everything that God invent, allow us to invent and to discover, we are allowed to use for our benefit. If there was a problem by women, and now Hashem found a solution that after all they will still have a way to have babies, not only it's allowed to use, it's mitzvah to use. Mitzvah to use. If a man had problem making his wife pregnant and they found a way to do it in the lab because they couldn't do it naturally, now it's mitzvah and if he had the kids, it's pruvu. He actually had mitzvah pruvu. 
So, Baruch Hashem, we understand this concept. Now we move on. In 13 principles of Judaism, as I explained to you, God reward the righteous and punish the wicked. However, in reality, we don't see it. That's why we have a second rule. Everything that Hashem does, it's with a lot of patience, and it's not instant. You don't get an instant reward, and you do not get an instant punishment. You don't get killed when you break Shabbat, even though the Torah said that Michalel Shabbat will die and would lose its share to the world to come. But some people are Michalel Shabbat for 50 years already, and are not, and are not dead, and are not even sick. They make millions. Their business is open on Shabbat, and they look happy. And some Shomre Shabbat die. They didn't live long life. Or they may be sick. Or maybe they're not rich enough. Where is the justice? The answer is, the justice is not in this world. When we leave the world, every one of us will have a trial. And in a trial, everyone will get what he deserves. You did good, you will earn good. You did bad, you will earn bad. You understand? So that's why we have to know. If every time we do something good, we will get the reward immediately, there will not be any more free will. Everyone will be righteous. If you give a $1,000 donation to the rabbi, and before you even finish, you already made 2000 And now you give another 1000 the next day, and again you made 2000 And now you give 2000 and you made 4000 You just discover a gold mine. Why should I even walk? All day I give donations. Rabbi, you don't move for me. Stand right here. Put your hands here. Thousand. Two thousand in a pocket. Take it out. Rabbi, two thousand. Four thousand came to the pocket. Rabbi, four thousand. Eight thousand came to the pocket. That's the way the world would be. Every time you give to the guy, immediately you make double. Or the other way around. You steal, you lose double. You steal again, you lose double. After two, three times, you get the point. No one will ever steal. You killed someone, boom, a tree fell on your head and you died. You killed another one, somebody else killed, he also died. No one will ever kill. Why? As soon as I kill someone, I'll kill myself. You break Shabbat, you light a cigarette. The Torah said death penalty. You lit a cigarette, <laughs> explode in your face, you died. Your friend did it, boom, explode in his face. That's it. From this moment on, no one will break Shabbat. Even the Arabs on Shabbat will stand like this. <laughs> Ahmed, ma, what happened? Shh, Shabbat, don't move. Okay, by mistake, we make a mistake, God will kill us. Don't move. But you're not a Jew. I don't take risks. Maybe my grandmother was Jewish. I don't know. I don't take risks. You get the point or no? So don't be surprised that sometimes righteous people don't get what you think they deserve to get. And don't be surprised why some Nazis don't get what they deserve to get. Everyone in the end will get exactly what they deserve to get. This you must trust God that is not a liar. He's not a member in Israeli Knesset or in Congress that all day lies to the people. When God says something, you know for sure it will happen. This you must understand. Therefore, tonight we decided that we're going to speak about dealing with the consequences of our action. Many of the things that we do today will affect us eventually. For instance, you can laugh at someone today when you're 20, and then 10 years later someone embarrass you in front of the whole audience. You don't see the connection. Everything Hashem does is midah keneged midah. Now we're going to the third rule. What is the third rule? When God punishes someone, He chooses an educational punishment. Midah keneged midah. Measure for measure. What does it mean measure for measure? You broke someone's tooth, someone one day will break your tooth. You make someone go out of business, 20 years later someone will get you out of business. You were happy that someone went to jail, 5 years later you go to jail. You were happy that someone had, uh, I don't know, all kinds of problems, you're going to get the same problem. You laugh at your friend's son, 
your son is going to have the same thing. In reality, you help someone, you save someone's life, someone will save your life. You help someone to have children, your kids that could not have children, someone will help them to have children. That's how everything works. The fact that you don't see the connection and it doesn't happen right away, doesn't happen right away, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now, this synagogue, there is one rabbi who teach here, Rabbi Moshe, Persian Moshe, Tzadik. I had the schut to make him Baal Tshuva many years ago. One time, I get a phone call from Brooklyn. Hi, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, yes. My name is a non-Jewish name from Brooklyn with lots of noise in the street. Yes, hi, can I help you? Do you know this person by name Moshe Mechtizadeh? Say, yes, I do. I just found his wallet in Brooklyn. I found his wallet. There's money there, his driver's license. So how did you find me instead of him? He doesn't have his telephone number, but my card was in his wallet, <laughs> my phone number. So the guy was clever enough to think, I don't have a way to find this guy, but this guy will tell me where to find him. So he called me up. And I say, what's your number? I wrote down his number. Don't worry, I'm going to have him call you soon. I told Moshe, the guy found your wallet. You looking for it? Yes. He's in Brooklyn. He went to meet the guy, which apparently found out that he's a Jew. The mother is Jewish. And started to make him Baal Tshuva. What made that guy come back to Hashem? He found the wallet. He returned the wallet to an anonymous person. He could have taken the money, no? Mm-hmm. He didn't grow up religious, this guy, or a Jew, but he thought he's a guy. <coughs> he only found out he's a Jew once he handed him the, the wallet. In that meeting, Moshe told him, you're not really a guy. You, your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. Started to teach him. So the, go, the guy, <laughs> goy, guy, the guy did something amazing. Return a lost object. What did Hashem pay him right away? Return his lost olam haba to him. Everything in life is midah kenegin midah. Midah kenegin. Now imagine if this guy would keep the money. How much money was there? I don't know. I don't even know if there was a hundred bucks there. He would keep the hundred bucks, let's say. And would die not even knowing he's a Jew. Missing Shabbat, missing all the opportunities the Torah gave us. That's what the Gemara say many times. Yes, Adam, kone olamo berega echad. A person can buy his eternal world in a moment. Yes, Adam, kone olamo berega echad. Sometimes he's writing a huge check to a good cause. That's already saved the olam haba. Sometimes he's saving a life of a person and that person becomes somebody very big and influential. Sometimes he's making someone uh, become religious and one day become the chief rabbi. It could be many things. It could be many, many things. In reality, Hashem see and watch and record and never forget anything. In Elo Yanum Velo Ishan, Shomer Israel. So the next time when you do something good and expect a profit or a reward and you're not getting it, please do not get confused. You will get what you deserve. It's just a matter of time. And remember, if you would get it right away, there would not be any free will. Everyone will be righteous. As soon as I do something good, immediately I make profit. Everybody in life understands that to make profit, you have to invest. You want to open now a pizza shop. Do you know how much headache you're going to have until you're going to start making profit? First, you have to find a store. You have to check the location and check how many people walk there every day. Once you found a store, you have to renovate it. You have to agree on on a rent. You have to sign a lease. You have to renovate the whole place, furniture, ovens, buy equipment, install it, dealing with plumbers, electricians, carpenters. So much headache. 
Then you have to find suppliers for the flour, for the uh, tomato sauce, for the spices, for the cheese, for the napkins, for the uh, paper goods. There's so many things you have to do. Hundreds of things. And then what happens? You walk like a slave and you make a living. Why you did not care to go through such nightmare for six months or a year, not making any money, because you know in the end it will pay off. You'll make money. And by the way, that's not even guarantee. More restaurants lose than make. Restaurant is the number one businesses that go out of business. It doesn't mean that if you have good food, you're going to be profitable. Sometimes your location is bad. Sometimes the attitude of the people that works by you make the customer run away. Sometimes you did everything right, but the chef by you is not so talented. Food is not so great. There could be many, many reasons, but in, re- in the end, whatever you make is, comes from Hashem. If Hashem wants you to make money, He will make the restaurant work. I saw restaurants in buildings that the chance that someone will find them is so small, and they are booming. I used to have a friend, I wonder where he is, it's been 20 years I didn't speak to him. An Israeli Kurdish guy, David his name, he opened a fancy suit store in a building in Long Island, in an office. In a building, not storefront. Do you know how much business he used to have, this guy? When I used to go buy suits from him, he used to give us very good prices for very expensive suits for very, very cheap price. We used to go guys from the yeshiva and buy the best suits for less than $200. Suits that worth over 1000 I could not believe how many people he had. All these lawyers and bankers. and the, the all word to mouth. Everything he brings is gone. Nobody, nobody could have ever find a store over there. But Hashem wanted him to make millions. And everybody told his friend and his friend and his friend. And everybody goes specially to his place, go on the third floor, go to that suite, go inside and see all the suits. And that's how he make money. And how many people in the street in the best location and they go out of business? Whatever Hashem wants in the end, that's what's going to be. You should know. Talent does not bring income. Wisdom does not bring income. Hard work does not bring income. Logically, the logic of the human being is, the harder I work, the more money I will make. That's nature. You work six hours a day, you make $120. You're going to work 12 hours a day, you're going to make double. You cannot deny that, that fact. The more efforts you put in a business, the more money you're going to make. You get paid by the hour. True or false? False. Of course that Hashem is not going to play with the law of nature. Nature is nature. You work an hour, it's 20. You work two hours, it's 40. Nature is nature. However, because Hashem wrote in Rosh Hashanah how much money you're going to make, He can never go a penny over it even if you're going to work 20 hours a day. It's not going to help you. Why? Because in Rosh Hashanah, Hashem wrote that you're going to make this year $60,000 net. That's it. Now you decide to kill yourself. What? If I'm going to work such and such hours, I'm going to make over 100 this year. Over 100,000. Reality, with the hours you work, you're right. But what you didn't know is that the engine of your car broke and you had to pay $12,000 to fix it. And someone stole your wife's press with $3,000 there. And one day someone robbed you by the ATM machine for another $5,000. And in the end of the year, you made exactly $60,000. You got from work 100. But how much you really made? 60. So all the extra hours you work was for nothing. If you didn't work them, you wouldn't be robbed, and the engine wouldn't die, and all the accidents that happened to you would not happen. The reason they happen is because Hashem had to reduce the money that you went and kill yourself to make more than the budget that He wrote to you 
He has to clean it up from you. There's no other way. Why? Because in Rosh Hashanah he wrote how much you're going to make and that's what's going to be. So all you have to do is to have a munah. Yes. What if you were supposed to make 60,000 but you work less hours than nature would give you that 60,000? Then your father-in-law one day would say, you know, I didn't do enough for my daughter and, and my son-in-law. I got some nice pension. Let's give them the maser. Moshe, we have a gift for you. Can you come tonight for dinner? Absolutely. Gives you an envelope with $20,000 and bring you up to what Hashem wrote. If not your father-in-law, IRS all of a sudden, get an order for Sleepy Joe. I want to give extra $2,000 for each family. All of a sudden, you get a check. You didn't expect. There's a lot of surprises in life. Income can be, income can be by finding a bargain. I'll give you an example. I have a student, I made him Baal Tshuva, he moved to Israel, became an Avrech. Mary, a girl of some Ashkenazi rabbi, he helped them nicely, that rabbi, but he's not a billionaire. He, he has other kids. Now they decided to buy their apartments. The owner loved him so much in Israel, he gave them the apartment for 1.6 million shekel when the value of that apartment is 2.4. And he has offers. So I saw people that offering him 2.4. The reason he gave him the money, the 1.6, because when they made the deal a year ago, he didn't get the money yet. So if you would like to buy it, I will give it to you for 1.6. At the time that he told them that he's going to give it to him for 1.6, it was worth 2 million. So he gives them 20% off the market. For one year, he went up to 2.4, and he still kept his word. And he gave it to him for 1.6. Saved him 800,000 shekel. This Avrech will work 30 years for 800,000 shekel. Hashem just gave him a 30 years bonus. 30 years. But wait a minute. He needs to get a mortgage. And the bank told him, we're not going to give you the mortgage unless you show us that you have 20% self-capital. And he doesn't have any capital. It's an avrech. No, what's, what are you going to do now? You have such a bargain, but you cannot prove the bank that you have money. And you cannot borrow the money because they're going to see that the money went into your account from someone, and they're going to ask, that's not your money. So what happened? Someone that does big business with the bank, the guy is, is a brother of his brother. He's a friend of his brother. His brother said, can you help him out, give him a loan? He put the money in his account, and he got the mortgage. How many people would lend money to a friend of their brother? The brother asks, can you give him the money? He needs to buy an apartment. Why? Is it important to you? Yes. He gave him 20% of the value. Put it in an account. When will he pay him back for the loan? May take 30 years. Who knows? <laughs> little by little. When Hashem wants you to have something, he will find a way. When he doesn't want to, or does not want you to have something. I was ready to buy an apartment in a house in Monsi 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Listen to this story. I had a nice American Ashkenazi broker from Monsi. I don't think she lives there anymore, but at that time she was in real estate. She knew the market very well. She was a very nice, very elegant lady. You know, older, you know, I believe she was in her 60s. She knows the market. She found me a house, a ranch, 40 years old. House 40 years old, it's not easy, you know. You have a lot of leaks, problem with the pipe, rust. Every week you have something to fix. But I was living by rent, and the, the landlord was pushing me out because he wants the apartment for his daughter. Daughter had more kids over the years. He wants the apartment. So I'm going with her to find an apartment. Finally, I found an apartment. Back then, the price, I think, was 700 and, uh, 
either 7.25 or 7.50, something like that. 7.25 probably. 7.25. You give down payment 10% and you buy and you get the mortgage. Top. The owner of that house was a very, very wicked, religious, criminal lawyer. Shark. Litigation lawyer, killer. Goes to the court in Manhattan, murderers, rapists, drug, drug dealer. You can see, evil person. He has yamaka on his head, but some people with yamaka are evil. What can we do? It's reality. You see that he's so arrogant and so proud and so full of himself and wearing those $10,000 suits and all this oil in his hair and the way he talks to you like you're some kind of a garbage. But he wants to sell that, apart, that apartment, that house. We reached an, an agreement. Oh, he didn't take a penny from the price, obviously. And I was anxious to get it. Now, in the kitchen, there was a round room, you know, with round, round windows. And he designed, custom-made, a glass table that is exactly for the size of this room. There's no way to use this table anywhere else. It's designed just for this room. With a chair exactly the size of the room, it leaves enough space from the wall. Mm-hmm. You can see it's custom made. I say to him, okay, I agree on the price, it didn't take off one dollar. Just leave me this table. Where will I get a table like this? Uh-huh. He told me, absolutely not. Four thousand dollars, you can have it for what I pay. Meaning he used it already for 20 years. It's still the, it wants full price. It cost me four thousand the glass. That's what you're going to pay. I said, okay, I saw that you have a lot of mattresses in the room. You're planning to take them? Some of them were still in a bag. You're willing to take them or I can keep them? No. You want them? You're going to have to pay for them. Now listen to me, the fool. I'm going down to the basement. There's no windows in the basement. And I see 12 humidifiers. 12 humidifiers. That means it's a sauna over there. Because it's in the ground, deep in the ground, and all the water keeps going in. And I'm so blind, I, I don't understand, like I'm totally, total fool. What normal person would want to touch such a house? The reason I wanted this house, because it, was, it, would, it looked very simple from the outside, but he renovated the whole inside, so it looks much nice, a nice kitchen and everything. But it's like taking a 75 years old woman and making her all kinds of plastic surgeries and she looks 40 now. <laughs> She goes on a shiduch with a guy 42, but she's 75. No, but she looks 40. But the bones, the bones, the heart, the legs, it's all 75 years old. It's like a car that has 100,000 miles and it changed the mileage. The mileage shot 20,000, but it's 100,000. But I ignore, I ignore, whatever I see, I ignore. Why? The guy, this Hasid is on my head. I need the apartment for my daughter. I need, I need, I need. In the end, I surrender to everything. I say, okay, fine. So you have until Monday, 5 p.m. to sign the contract and come with a check 10% to my agent. He gives me his card. I'm Israeli. Israelis usually don't stick to the exact deadline. So 10 minutes to 5. I leave my house. It's broken only five minutes away from me. So I still have ten minutes. No, I waited for the last minute. But I have the contract signed, and I have the check attached. And I still have until five. I didn't, I did not miss the deadline. Five to five, I get a phone call from this broker. Where are you? On the way to give, to end the contract. No! I'll never forget that phone call. It's too late! He just called me up so angry. Your guy did not hand the contract. The deal is off. My heart dropped. Imagine, first thing came to my mind is, what would I tell that Hasid after I told him I'm moving out? I got so scared. I said to her, why? He said, we have until five. I didn't, it's not five yet. Still a few minutes. No! He's so upset. I mean, he's so angry. 
I said, oh, we have a rule, everything Hashem does is for our own good. Even though right now it looks a disaster, my situation looks like a disaster. How can I do? The next day she calls me up. The next day. Listen. There is a house. Brand new. They just finished building it. It was built for the guy that designed the PayPal software. Some Russian Hasid, Bal Chuva. Russian, Russian they're good with computer. He designed the PayPal system. Made many millions, this guy. Very rich guy. The architect built the house for him and he changed his mind. And he gave 10% non-refundable. It's not subject to mortgage. But he doesn't want the house. Would you consider to look at it? It's not that much more than the other one that you saw yesterday. But it's brand new and it's two floors. And it's double on the size. And it's a much better location. The heart of Monsi on the hill. I say, but how will I see the house? Says, Don't worry. It's not finished, but I'll take you to another town, not far, that that builder already built this house. You can see it. I come to the player. Oh, ma? <laughs> Almost the same price. You serious? Yes. Remember, after you take the 10%, it became the same price. Double on the side, brand new, not 40 years old. Basement above the ground with windows. You walk in. No, you made it. You made it. None of these things. Million times better location. Today it's worth double than the other house. And guess what? I put such a curse on this Rasha that I should never sell this house. And today, 20 years later, he never sold the house. 20 years, he did not sell the house. And the Ezrat Hashem will never sell it. Such a Rasha Kaze you never saw. You know, someone like this with a yamaka on his head does not, cannot be counted in a minyan. Did you know that or no? Criminal lawyer. He goes to work in a secular court follow the laws of the Goim, big Chilul Hashem, who told you it's kosher to be a criminal lawyer. Baruch Hashem, I saved a lot of my students that wanted to be criminal lawyers. I said to them, absolutely not, but I want to be a lawyer. What lawyer you can be that it's kosher? Who knows? Only one. Real estate and business. That's it. No other lawyer is kosher. Even family lawyer, it's not kosher. Why? A woman was religious. She was married to a religious man. Then she decided that she doesn't want to be so religious anymore. Slowly, slowly, she left the religion. She's not so modest anymore. And she made, she met a Puerto Rican boyfriend online. And she started to cheat on her husband. While she had reli four religious kids in yeshiva. She has a boyfriend, Puerto Rican guy. I'm actually describing to you a story that happened. I'm not telling you who and where and when, but just for you to get the point. She eventually one day come to her husband. She said, I'm leaving you. I have a boyfriend, Tony, whatever his name was, and I'm, I'm taking the kids with me to live with that guy. Someone, you're out of your mind. The kids in yeshiva. Where are you going to take them? What are you going to feed them? My kids going to live with this guy? A war began. She goes to court, a Jewish judge, and a Jewish prosecutor, meaning the lawyer of the, of the woman, is also a Jew. Between that wicked Jew and the wicked judge Jew, they took the kids away from this miserable guy. Not only he lost his wife, he has to give her half of the house and she took the kids out of yeshivot and she will raise the kids in a public school and murder four souls. Who is going to pay for those four souls for eternity in hell? The lawyer and the judge. Do you want to be a lawyer? Think a billion times before you become a family lawyer or before you become a criminal lawyer and send rapists back to the street and con artists back to the street. And pedophiles, you send them back to the street. And murderers, you send them back to the street. What do they do, these criminal lawyers? Either they bring 
uh, they, they send innocent people into jail, or they bring monsters out of problems and they send them back to the street. i give you an example. If you bought stocks based on information that your friend gave you, my father company is doing very well. They're going public next month. The stock right now is $20. Go buy as many as you can. When they show their products to the market, the stock will go up in one day to 100 Run and buy. You went, you bought 10,000 shares, $20 each. A lot of money, right? So now you invested $200,000 in the stocks. Baruch Hashem, you have it. Boom! The company announced all their good products. Your money went up five times more. The 200000 jumped to a million. The FBI and the SEC, SEC, they have special computer software. When they see a suspicious transaction, like a day before it went up a lot, someone bought a lot, they have, they have a, f- a formula. Algorithm. Duck, red flag. They begin to monitor. They see, until now, you never had a purchase of 200,000 in your life. You buy 10,000, 3,000, 5,000, 1,000. All of a sudden, you buy 200,000 a day before. Obviously, someone tipped you. They freeze your bank account. They come to your house. They arrest you. They take you to jail. Now you have a trial, they send you to five years in prison and $10 million fine. I know someone that happened to him. $10 million fine, even though you only made 800000 doesn't matter. $10 million fine, five years in prison. This person did anything wrong according to the Torah? Nothing whatsoever. Why not? A friend gave him a good advice, go buy. I went and I didn't steal. I bought and I made profit. Just like someone told me, my father wants to sell his supermarket for half a price because he's old. And he wants to get rid of it in one day and move to Israel. Run, run, make him an offer before he puts it in a newspaper. You run, how much you want for it? Give me a million, it's worth two million. Give me a million cash, I sell it. No problem. Ah, Here, let's sign the papers. If he will put it in a newspaper, he will get two millions, but it will take three months. Because he ran and bought the supermarket for cheap, did he commit any crime? No. So according to the Torah, there's nothing is wrong here. Nothing. But according to the laws of the United States, it's a crime. Now the Jewish lawyer, that the prosecutor that goes after you, is going against the Torah. With Yamaka, without Yamaka, it doesn't matter. He break the rules of the Torah. He is going after an innocent person to destroy his life and his family. And the judge, the Jew... That also is a Jew, also judge the person according to the rules of the Goim, not according to the rules of the Torah. So that's another criminal. So between the first and the second criminal, an innocent person will go for, to prison for five years. Who is going to pay for these five years that they sent him over there? Those two criminals. No one can get away with what they do. No one. You caused him to do it. You have to pay for those years of his life that were lost. I'll tell you a story. There was one rabbi in yeshiva in Israel, in Bnei Brak. Rabbi, teach kids. One time, one time a, a kid walked in the door, and he was very fat, the king, the kid. Big, big, massive. And I don't know what happened to that rabbi. A very bad sentence came out of his mouth. He said to that kid in front of the whole class, I'm surprised you can still walk through the door with this weight. And everybody laughed. You know how kids are. And that kid got very insulted. And that was the beginning of his crush and relationship with religion. He got so scarred that he said, I don't want anything to do with this kind of religious rabbis and people. The years went by, one time this Rebbe, this Rebbe in general was a righteous man, but even righteous people make mistakes. 
One day he walks in the street and he finds one of his students on the street. Hi, how are you? I got married, I have children. What happened with the rest of the class? Can you tell me? Yeah, this guy is in New York. This one is in business. This one is a rabbi. This one is an avrech in yeshiva. And what about this one, the fat one? Oh, that's a very sad story, Rebbe. What? He's in depression for many years. He's living in some tiny room. He didn't get married. He doesn't do anything with his life. Doesn't learn, doesn't work. Totally depressed and broken. And I'm sorry to tell you that, but he blames you for that. That you're the one who destroyed his life. Me? I destroyed his life? God forbid. How did I destroy his life? Remember one time you made fun of him that he's fat when he walked through the door? That's destroyed his life? One comment I made? Yes. That's it. Where is he? He gave him the address. Quickly. He ran quickly to his apartment. Knocked on the door. The boy opened the door. He's not a boy anymore. He's by now 25. Opened the door. And he said to him, ah, What are you doing here? How did you find me? I met this kid on the street. He told me about you. I came to apologize. I never knew that I offended you so bad. If I knew, I would apologize a long time ago. Why didn't you say anything? It's okay. It's too late already. Anyway, my life is over. No, no, no. God forbid. I have to fix what I've done. First, I want you to forgive me. I'll do everything I can to help you. You know what the kid told him? There's only one way I will forgive you. If you bring all the students of the class back to the same class, that they will all sit in the same chair where they were sitting back then, and I will walk in the door, and you will stand there like you were used to be in a class, and you apologize to me in front of everyone and tell them how you destroyed my life, and that you accept on yourself never to do it to any other kid, and everybody would see that you apologize to me in the same class, that's when I will forgive you. No other way. No, please don't be so cruel. I will going to bring 30 kids to the class. Some of them are in New York, in Europe. Where will I find them? It's not possible what you're asking. Take it or leave it. That's it. Either that or nothing. This Rebbe cannot sleep at night now. <coughs> it's written in the Gemara, Amalbin pne chavero barabim, keilu shofech damim. Amalbin pne chavero barabim, en lo chelek laolam haba. Someone who insults his, his friend in public has no share to the world to come. Someone that insults his friend in public is like spilling his blood. It's a very big avon, very big sin to insult a person in public. But the kid doesn't want to forgive. So he went to Rav Eliashiv. He was the biggest rabbi in the world, biggest posek. And he said to Rav Eliashiv, I did the math, the calculation. How much would it cost me to bring 30 kids back to the class? I have to pay airfare. I have to pay hotel for those who come from Europe or from uh, assuming they all agree to come. I have to pay people for the day of the day they take off from work. It came to how much? Seventeen thousand dollars. This story was more than twenty years ago, so it's like fifty thousand today. Seventeen thousand dollars, which is my salary for the entire year. He makes fifteen hundred dollars in yeshiva in Israel. That's his salary. So seventeen thousand dollars. That means this rebbe has to teach from morning to night, from morning to night, for one year, for free, just to get forgiveness from this kid. He asked Rav Eliash if, if it's realistic. Do I have to do what he demands? Rav Eliash told him, "What's the question? You want to lose your share to the world to come? That's worth a lot more than seventeen thousand dollars." Of course, why are you even asking? You must do it. And he had to do it. Imagine such a thing, to bring 30 kids back into the class. Beg each one of them, you have to do it, otherwise your Rebbe won't have Olam Abba. How many people we insulted in our life? We don't even know where they are. 
one day we come to the court of heaven and they show us what happened after that. We only know what happened the moment that we insulted them. But we don't know what happened after. The consequences of it, we don't know. Maybe you find out that some of the people you got fired from work or some people you ruined their reputation because of you they never got married or because of you they committed suicide or because of you they left their religion and you're going to get the shock of your life. You're going to get the shock of your life. In Monsi there used to be a very holy rabbi. He lived 96 years. Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky. Father, his son is also one of the biggest rabbi in Philadelphia. Rav Shmuel Kaminetsky. He's also now in his 80s. His father passed like over 25 years ago. He passed 96 years old. And never ever in his entire life said a lie from his mouth. He left, he lived 96 years and he never lied once in his life. Be'ezrat Hashem, we would live one day without saying a lie. One day. Not 96 years, it's too much to ask. One day without ever lying. The whole day. Wow, it's a big achievement. So, this Rav Kaminetsky, when he was a, a fresh groom, fresh groom, he just got married, him and his bride, they walked to a town in Russia, were, back then there was no trains like today. We're talking uh, about uh, almost 90 years ago. This story is 90 years ago when he was, a, he just got married, he's 20 years old, he walks with his kala, and they have to go to the town and have to get there by Friday. And now it's Wednesday evening. And it's snow, massive snow. It's hard to walk. Plus it's freezing wind. He said to his wife, we have to find a place to sleep. It's too cold to sleep outside. So they said, what are we going to do? Let's look for the houses, which one has a mezuzah and knock on the door. Otherwise we'll die here. We freeze to death. They found a nice house, very nice, of a rich man. They knocked on the door. He opened the door. Yes, can I help you? We got stuck on the road. We have to get to that town by Friday. If you can give us a room just to sleep until the morning, we'll leave early in the morning. The guy said to them, I'm sorry, I cannot let you enter my house. Please, we're begging, it's pikuach nefesh, it's life risk. He's religious and they're religious. He doesn't let them in. After begging him, it didn't help. Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky asked him, there was a cover, like a little plastic roof on the side of the house. So can we at least stay outside under the, the rain or the, or the snow won't fall on our head until the morning? We're going to be here in, your, in your, the side yard. The guy thinking, okay, over here you can stay, but don't move from there. You must stay there until the morning and leave. So in the morning they left. Friday they arrived to the town. Shabbat morning he comes to the synagogue. And who does he see over there sitting next to the rabbi on the stage? That guy, the rich guy, in the synagogue. Everybody kiss up to him. And Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky was Ish Emet. How can people even look at such a rasha? He wouldn't, let, he wouldn't care that we'll freeze to death when he has so many empty rooms in his house. He wouldn't take a Jew in to let him sleep. What kind of a person you are? So Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky went to the Gabai. He said, who is this person that you give him such an honor? You give him Aliyat Shlishi by the Ashkenazim. It's the most important Aliyah on Shabbat. is the Shlishi, after Levi. You give him Aliyat Shlishi? Who is this guy? He said to him, well, why are you upset at him? He told him the story. He said to him, don't be upset at him. I'll explain to you after the davening what happened to him. Tov. When the davening finished, he comes to Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky, which at that time was only Yaakov, he wasn't a rabbi yet. And he said to him, listen, this person was the number one hospitality house in town. Every person who came to town, we placed them by him, guests. Day after day, years, he's 
the number one hospitality. You go, you need something, you go to sleep by him, you eat by him, he gives donation, he helps to build this building. So how come he didn't let me in just for a few hours to sleep? He said, because a few days before you got there, he let someone sleep there as you normally used to do, and he robbed him. He cleaned everything from his house, all the cash, the silver things, everything, put everything in a sheet, and ran away in the middle of the night. After he gave him the room for free and food and drink and shower, what did this person did? Stole everything in the middle of the night and ran. So he made a nether, he made a vow that he does not let anyone anymore sleep as strangers that he doesn't know stay by him ever again after that. And lucky you, you just show up two, three days later after he was fury, furious and you, and you couldn't go in. Ah, now it's a whole different story. Before, I think such an evil person, he cannot let me in. Now when you hear the story, okay. This story was told by Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul 30, 40 years ago in Ponovich, in, uh, slicha, in uh, Porat Yosef. Yeshiva Porat Yosef, Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, the biggest Faradi rabbi in the world at that time. When Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul told the story, there was a reason why he told the story. He asked the students, what sin the thief committed stole let's say ten thousand dollars value of things and and ran away what sin did he commit you should not steal also he's an ungrateful person right kfui tova the gemara say meshiv ra'a tacha tova lo tamush ra'a mi beto someone that repay back to someone who did great things to him, but he pays him bad for the good that he received, bad will never remove any more from his house. This person is scarce for life. Someone helped you, brought you in, helped you to get a job, helped you to get a car, helped you to get married, not to talk about made you bal tshuva, then you owe him your eternity, not just the car. Your eternity. When you see him, it's like you see God. That's how you have to behave. Imagine someone who saved your soul and you speak like on about him. <laughs> I have some like this. Yeah, took them from the garbage, made them who they are, and what do they do? Speak like on about me. Not one or two, many. There are people like this. So, Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul say, for stealing, what's... How you fix it? How you fix it? You come and return. That's it. One day the thief come back. Yes, I remember me. Five years ago I stole your silver sting and some cash. Here, it's all here. Please, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I'm, I'm so ashamed. I'm begging you to forgive me. It's all here. I didn't use anything. Once he did it and he forgave you, you clean. But Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, he has very deep eyes and a super sharp brain. He say, but let me ask you this. What happened, what would have happened if Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky will freeze to death that night and die? Chaz The most important rabbis in America that made thousands of rabbis under him, that taught them Torah, was Rosh Yeshiva Torah Vadat, and a symbol of perfect human being. Honest, midot, unbelievable personality. So many Ashkenazi American rabbis became who they are thanks to him. If he died that night when he was 20, there was no Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky. There was no 5,000 American good rabbis, serious Ashkenazim, tzaddikim, that learns Torah and teach Torah. All of that will go down the drain for the stupid, ungrateful thief that stole what he stole. When that thief will come to Shamaim thinking, yeah, I stole some money. Okay, I'll get my punishment. He will get to his trial. 
And Hashem say to him, you are a spiritual Adolf Hitler. Ma? Me? No, 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 excuse me, excuse me, there's a mistake here. My name is Yitzchak Cohen. Ma pitom Adolf Hitler? What are you talking about? Spiritual Adolf Hitler. Yeah, you didn't murder tens of millions of people. But you murdered thousands of souls of Talmidei Chachamim, of rabbis. All of them died the day you stole those silver things. Why? Because Rav Yaakov, their teacher, died and they never came to the world. Now you have to pay for each one of them. No. Now what will happen if you would return everything, that thief? It won't help. It only helps for the stealing. But the damage that he caused, if Chas Shalom he would have died, it's too late to fix. That's called in the Torah, Me'uvat Lo Yuchal Itkon. Me'uvat, I'll give you an example. If you have a vase, and it got chipped, a piece, a piece broke, you take nice glue, ceramic glue, you do a good job, you glue it back, you clean the glue, Right? And looks perfect. Besides you, no one will ever know. It's $10,000 vase. Okay, no one will ever know it's cracked. Because you, you, the piece did not break too many pieces. It was only one piece. You matched it like a puzzle, you glue it, finished. But what happened if he broke to 5,000 pieces? Little crumbs all over. Can you glue it? No. There's no correction for it. Some sins you can fix. Some sins there's no way to fix. You murder a human being. Can you bring him back to life? Can you give back the children the horrible life that they had? Can you repay them? Can you compensate them They're going up without a father? Can you compensate the widow for being alone for so many years? Crying for, for hundreds of nights? Can you pay the parents for losing a child? Can you pay the brothers and sisters for living with the, with, the, with the pain every day of their life? No. You can repent and beg Hashem for tshuva, yes. And you may even be forgiven. But the reality is what you've done, there's no way to fix it. There's sometimes no way to fix it. What happened if you took a Jew that was learning in yeshiva and convinced him to leave yeshiva and come to work with you in 47th Street? How long are you going to be telling me the yeshiva? Don't you want to prepare your future? Come, I'll teach you to sell gold, to buy gold, to sell diamonds. After a year, you'll be able to go on your own, or two years. And that kid left the yeshiva and came to work in 47 and learned the job and started to make a lot of money and became very rich eventually. But he became Chalel Shabbat, secular, that's it. After he left the yeshiva, slowly, slowly, he left the religion. He stopped coming to shul. He stopped putting tefillin. And what happened in the end? He became a much like a non-Jew. You don't even know, because by now he left your job and he went on his own. You don't know he became secular. Now you come to Shamaim, you're thinking you did a big mitzvah. You help a Jew to have parnasa. And they show you what happened to him. And now you have to pay for him and for all his children who goes to public school and the child that became a drug addict and the other child that is full of tattoos and the daughter that went with an Arab and married him and she lives now in some Arab village and all her children became Muslim and they joined the Hamas and they kill Israeli citizens on a weekly basis. I'm not telling you fairy tales. All the things I tell you happen every minute as we speak. Do you know how many Arab terrorists are Jews? Thousands. Half of the Hamas are Jews. Half of the Jihad are Jews. 60,000 Israeli women married Arabs in Israel in the last seven years. 60,000. Each one of them had an average 10 kids. That's 600,000 Palestinians that are Jewish according to the Torah. And almost all of them joined the terror organization. Why? Because they want to prove to the rest of the Arabs that they're not Yahud. They're not Jews. They're not traitors. Because the Arabs keep cursing them, you dirty Jew, you dirty Jew, you dirty Jew. How is this kid will prove that he's not a dirty Jew? 
that is a, is a proud Muslim, join the Hamas. And then come and shoot at people in the street and kill 20. And he's a Jew. That's what's happened, Rabotai. Things that we do have consequences. Things that we do have major consequences. It works both ways. Not only negative. One good thing you do can go to a massive thing. You open up a yeshiva. Small. Ten people. Twenty years later, more and more people came to the place and donated more and more and more and made the place big. And now you have 300 people learning there. You go to heaven, you get reward for all 300. Because you started it. Without you, none of it would be here. 300 people learn Torah every minute, all the reward goes to your account, even though you already died. That's called the consequences of our action. Everything I told you in the last hour, it's written in one verse. Who knows where? In Prophet Irmiah, Jeremiah. What does it say? Meshalem Adam I pay the person like the fruit of his action. Not like his actions, like the fruits of his action. Do you understand what it means or no? Let me read it to you. It's in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 19. Gdol Aetza the one who always have the best advices. Verav Alila is able to do anything he wants with no limit, no limitation. Asher enecha p'kuchot al kol darke b'nei adam, that your eyes are always open to supervise what people are doing. Latet le'ish kidrachav, to give every human being according to his way. And the fruit of his actions. Not his actions. The fruit of his action. That's a big change. Critical change. Because what does it mean to pay someone like his action? You give a smack to a person. You insulted him in front of people. Boom! You gave him a smack. And he left. You're going to be punished for the smack. You're not allowed to eat a person. One punishment. No. That person now saw that he got a smack from a guy with a yarmulke on his head, became immediately a hater of Jews. This guy. He became anti Semite. Well, this guy with the yarmulke gave me a smack in front of everyone, insulted me. Now, from now on, his entire life, every time he sees an option to hurt Jews, he does hurt them. He can kill, he can rape, he can beat up, he can do all kinds of damages to their cars. You have to be responsible for all these actions, not just for the smack. What came out of that smack? Same thing is the other way around. I think in the time of uh, President Truman, Harry Truman, it was after the Holocaust, right? The Americans had to vote if to let Jews enter America or not about 100,000 survivors. They have no country to go to. Nobody wants to accept them. Look at these evil nations, such evil nations. After what they see happen to the Jews, now one country wanted to accept them. Nobody wants to open the border. But in America, they had also a big argument. Even here, these evil people that were here did not want them to enter America. Until the President Truman had a speech and he said that where he works, there are three religious Jews in the same office where he worked before he became a president. And there were such nice people, so honest, so polite, always volunteered to help, so smart, and also God-fearing people. If we can get another 100,000 people like this to come here now from this nation, this race, that's going to be the best blessing to America. After that speech, they voted yes. Everything you see in America today, Lakewood Yeshiva, Mir Yeshiva, this synagogue, thousands of other synagogues, 
all the money that goes from America to the yeshivot in Israel and create so much Torah and so many Jewish families goes to the account of these three Jews for the Kiddush Hashem they did. Because without them, the rest of the Jews would die there in Europe and there would not be anything here. If they were nasty, if they were arrogant, if they were steal, if they would treat the goyim like garbage, what, do we, what would he say? I agree, we should not take these lousy people. Don't bring garbage to here. We have enough of our own. So actually, without knowing even what they are doing, those three, without knowing, they earn the biggest reward you can imagine. Basically doing nothing, just behaving nice. Behaving nice, like religious people are supposed to behave. Modesty, the way the women dress. It's not only religion, it's class. Every Goy and Goya knows that. Someone who dress mothers has a class. Someone who dress like animals do not have class. They don't have class. They're low-level people. You will never find a high-level high politician dressed like a prostitute on the street. Never. Why? I represent the United States. I represent the government. I'm an important lawyer in an important firm. I cannot come like I go to the beach. But the cheap women on the street... They walk with bathing suit on the street. They have no respect. Like animals. Animals don't get dressed. But did you ever see Queen Elizabeth dressed not modest in her entire life? She's in the 90s. Find me one picture of her that is not modest. She's a Goya. She's not a Rebitzin. She's not religious. There used to be a black woman in a government here, Condoleezza Rice. She was always dressed modest. Even Hillary Clinton which is a very wicked person, would always dress modest. Why? Important lawyer, secretary of state, whatever she was. When, the, when you are in a high position, you have to watch very carefully how you represent yourself because it's affect what you represent. If you go to get a job in Microsoft as a salesperson and you come with shorts and sleeveless shirt, and sneakers, and long hair with ponytail and some earring over here, most likely no one will ever hire you. But if you come dressed with a very nice suit, nice haircut, clean, organized, nice bag with you, speaks politely, you have a chance. Maybe yes, maybe not. But now you have a chance. But when you dress like a low life, you have no chance. Not no one normal a businessman would want his company to be represented by this clown that dressed like an animal and behave like an animal. No. There's nothing to do with religion. Of course, when you follow the religion, the clothes is a very important thing in the life of a person. Why do we call clothes in Hebrew beged? Bgadim. Beged. Bet gimel daled. Bet Gimel Daled is also Bagad. Boged. You know what's Boged? A trader. Someone that betray someone. A trader. Bagad. Boged. To betray someone. Why clothing and betraying is the same word, same letters? Because why human being has to get dressed? Because Adam committed a sin and betrayed God. God told him, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, wisdom. After he ate from the tree and his wife, what's the first reaction was? They were ashamed that they are naked. Immediately they saw themselves clothes from leaves of the fig tree. Kutonot or. They made themselves clothes to cover their private parts. Why is it? Because Hashem, in the beginning, told them you don't, have, don't eat from the tree, meaning you're like an animal. Animal does not feel ashamed that they are naked. Did you ever see an animal that is embarrassed to show up because it walks naked? No. Animals have relation in a street, in a safari, in front of people that take pictures and they're not embarrassed. For one second, they didn't think they do something wrong. We have today in the world millions of women and men also that already are worse than those animals. 
They appear in all kinds of movies. The whole world see them, include their own children. Imagine being a movie star. You act in a film. You kiss and do other things with a man that is not your husband just for the purpose of making a film. And your children sitting in a living room with their friends from class and see their naked mother kissing some guy in the street when the father is in the room. Do you know what a tragedy this is? How many, women, how many movie stars women you have in the world? Million. Million, at least million. They lost dignity. They lost everything. For what? For fame and money. Fame and money. Check their life. Usually their life all ends very bad. Either drug addicts or five divorces, problem with the children, all kinds of addictions. They are cursed. Because God, there's nothing he hates more than lack of modesty and ungrateful people. And Adam and Eve ate and immediately they went to make themselves claws. The name of clause will be named after their first act of betray. Beged, Gadim. Any question before we finish? That's it. Who? Yeah, yeah, please. Louder, you're very far. There is a mitzvah, there is a, mitzvah, there is a mitzvah called Shiluah Haken. When you walk in the street or in the forest and you see a nest with a mother bird and eggs or chicks, the mother is in a, in a nest with the babies, there's a mitzvah to send the mother away, make the mother fly, and take the eggs, take them away, and put them somewhere. Technically, you can even return them back to the nest. But in general, you take them and put them someone, somewhere. That's a very strange mitzvah. Yeah, because it's cruel to do such thing. Especially f- from the same Torah that say that if you torture animals, you're going to be punished severely. If you smack a dog or a cat or any other animal, it's equal to eating pork. Same thing. How many Jews would agree to eat pork? Not that many. I mean, religious Jews. So if a Jew, you ask him to eat pork, you say, what, are you crazy? But then at the same time, he can take a cat and throw the cat from the window. Or, st- or starve the animal. Or not taking them out to their bathroom. Or all kinds of things like that. Tsar ba'ale chaim da'oraita, the Torah say. You're torturing animals, it's a sin from the Torah. How come the same Torah say, well, but when it comes to the bird, if you want to have long life in this world and in the next world, get rid of the mother and take the eggs or the chicks. It looks like a serious contradiction. The answer is, when you do it, it breaks your heart, Right? Rav Ovadia Yosef, the chief Sfaradi rabbis that just passed away a few years ago, one time did this mitzvah and he was crying while he was doing it. Talking to the bird and apologizing to her. Much like that. I'm so sorry. I really don't want to do it. But what can I do that God commended me? Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Much talking to the bird. He did it with a broken heart. So, obviously when someone does such a thing, it feels very bad. One day we die, and we stand for a trial. The trial is one year. That's why we say Kaddish, for people that pass for one year. We stand in front of Hashem for a trial, and we analyze every second of our life, from the beginning to the end. And he will get to the moment that we did that mitzvah. And when we got rid of the, of the mother, the bird, how we were actually having tears in our eyes and a broken heart. And Hashem will ask us, what did you feel when you did this mitzvah? 
and we will answer, to be, to be honest with you, God, horrible. I really didn't want to do it. It broke my heart for three days after that. And Hashem say, right, that was the whole purpose of this mitzvah, to break your heart. But I have one question to ask you. Why did you cry for the bird? Because the bird lost their baby, right? Why don't you cry about me that I lost 80% of my Jewish kids? They're all intermarried, they're all mechalelei Shabbat. All of them became goyim. They assimilated all over the world. Not once in their life they come to the synagogue. They hate my Torah. They hate religion. They change their name to not Jewish, kid, not Jewish names. Did you ever cry for me that 12 million of my children, the Jews, are totally lost? Drug addicts, thieves, in jail, marry all kinds of goyot. Their children are not Jewish. Not once they put filin. I lost 80% of my children. I never saw once that you cry like that. So the way to prevent that question, by the way, this question will be asked even if we don't do this mitzvah. In general, Hashem will ask every Jew why you did not give tons of money to save lost Jewish souls, what we call Kiruv. That's why my organization called Rabbi Mizrahi Kiruv Organization. Kiruv means bring people karov, close to Hashem. Hashem will ask every person, especially the wealthy one, that can give a lot of donations, but they're cheap, they don't give. They burn money on nonsense, but they won't give to save souls. Hashem will ask every one of them, you didn't care about my pain, that my children are lost, I gave you millions of dollars and you couldn't give at least 10-20% donation for someone who saves souls, how come? We won't have what to answer, those who don't give. They will be in a very big problem. Even though they were very religious, they will have a very big problem. Because it shows that they really don't love God. Because if you love a person and his child is in trouble, he will do everything you can to return that child to that parent. Everything you can. If you ignore it and you move on with your day, that means you don't love the father or the mother. There's no other explanation. So how can I not love God? I'm religious. You're religious for selfish reason. Because you're afraid to go to hell. You're afraid to lose all your money. You're afraid to get cancer. You're afraid to get punishment. You're afraid not to go to heaven. So you're selfish. You don't really do it for Hashem. You do it for yourself. But when you run to save other souls, you're not doing it for yourself. You do it for Hashem. That's why it's the highest reward, by the way. That's why Hashem gave us this mitzvah. That when we actually cry for separating between a parent to a child, meaning the bird and the, and the babies, it breaks our heart. We sh it should have broken our heart to see that Hashem lost so many of His children and do everything we can to bring them back. That's one of the main reasons for this mitzvah. And of course, by the way, you should know, that there are 2,999 more reasons for this mitzvah. King Solomon say, every mitzvah in the Torah have 3,000 reasons. 3,000 reasons. How many of them we know? If we lucky, five. The highest. Five. Ask any big rabbi in the world. For any mitzvah you want in the 613. Give me all the reasons you know why God gave us this mitzvah. They won't pass the five. Most of the time they won't know at all. I have no idea why Hashem made this mitzvah. Why I have to take the blood of the sacrifice and put it on the ear? No, go figure. Only God knows why. Why I have to splash on a parochet? Only God knows why. Why when a person brings a korban, the person that brought the korban can take the skin and he gets it? Why this and not that? Why he can eat this and he cannot eat that? Why you have to take these parts and give it to the Kohen and other parts you burn? There's a lot of secrets. We don't know. But even if we know some of the reasons, it will be one, two, three, four, five, the most. Meaning, look how much we lost. King Solomon knew all the 3,000 reasons for all the 612 mitzvot. One mitzvah, he said, that's above my ability. 
which one? Red cow. He admitted that the red cow, he doesn't know the secrets of it. It's uh, uh, higher than my ability. So even Shlomo HaMelech wasn't perfect. That's why we say, but chasreu me'at me'elokim. You made him a little bit less than God, meaning you told him all the secrets of the world. He got a gift from Hashem to get the wisdom that no one ever had. But even he got a little bit less than Hashem. I would like to thank you very much for coming here tonight in such pouring rain. You have another question? Yeah. We have three nests on the backyard on, on the top of the line. Yes. So my daughter, if you give it needs, I don't know, does it count that it's mitzvah? Because it's... Uh, if it's in your own property, it doesn't count. Because the Torah says, Ki ikare lecha kan tzipor baderech. When you are on the way. But there is a way to do it. Where is it? In the terrace? It's in backyard. Yeah. Backyard. Yeah. You can make the backyard hefker. You know what hefker? Okay. I'm giving it back. I'm giving it out. I'm removing my ownership from that. Just to say that what? Yes. Ani agina tachatzer. Now it's not yours. You can do it, okay. and then you get back the chatzer. So can you do the second one? Yes. Okay. Or somebody else can do it in your yard. You do it yourself. Why? You want to live to a hundred years old? No, <laughs> my kids. It doesn't matter. Yes, you can do it. Yes. Yes, yes, mitzvah. Big mitzvah. Yes. Why is there a mock look at a person or a convert or not? Because in order to convert, there has to be a basis of the people. You're asking right now one of the most complicated questions in Judaism which will take me an hour to explain. <laughs> Let's not get into it, yeah. I have a whole thing, a whole article about this question, yeah. How is your rabbi 